All right, it looks like we've got some more people joining us. So I think it's time to get, get this show on the road. Uh, happy Thursday, everyone. My name is Kyle Guy. I am the Director of Marketing and Digital Communications here at Be Found Online. And I would like to thank you all for attending our webinar today, Streamlining Your Internal Linking. Before we start today, I wanted to let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded. And if you are attending, we plan to send the replay of this webinar out after today. So um, expect that in your inbox early next week. Other than that, I think we're ready to get going here. So um, let's move on. All right, so as you know, today we are talking internal linking and I am very happy to be introducing today's speakers. Our speakers are Steve Kroll, CEO and co-founder of Be Found Online, and Gabe Adlot, Senior Analyst and SEO for Be Found Online. If you're not familiar with Be Found Online, we are a team of seasoned digital marketers, and with us, you always get the A-team. We work hard to be a good partner, a good employer, and a good corporate citizen. Our HQ is in Chicago, which means it's afternoon here, and our amazing humans reside throughout the U.S. and in Belize. Uh, and with that, I would like to turn this over to Steve Crow. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for affording us part of your day, letting us into your living room, as the old news anchors used to say. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. What we're gonna do here is that uh, Gabe is really the talent on this on this webinar. Uh, Gabe lives for internal linking. Gabe can find opportunities on client websites through internal linking like you wouldn't believe. And it's pretty incredible when you dust off your internal linking programs and actually put a plan behind it, how much opportunity can be found in <coughs> grooming, if you will, your internal links. So I'll get us started, walk us through sort of what our outline is, what we're gonna cover today. If you've got questions, throw them in that chat thing down there or Q and A. I'm not sure which Kyle has active, but we'll collect the questions. We'll leave 10 or 15 minutes at the end of our presentation today to answer your questions. So feel free to drop them in there. Anything you've got, we're gonna try and answer. If we can't answer it, we're gonna make it up. Okay, we're not supposed to make it up. If we can't answer, we'll get back to you. <laughs> All right, so this is our quick outline. I'm not gonna bore you with reading it. We're gonna just go ahead and dive in and we're gonna start talking about what is link building. So at a high level, I think everybody knows that link building is this idea of one is connecting to relevant content, whether it's on your site or it's on, an, on another site. And it's also a way to drive authority and ultimately growth. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna turn it over to Gabe to take us a little bit deeper in terms of what some of this stuff means and why it's important for us to talk about it from an internal linking perspective. So we have five terms here. We hear them you know, tossed around a lot. We have internal linking, which is basically just a link from a page on your website to another page on your website. We have an external link, which can really be one of two things, either a link pointing out from your website to another website, basically like a citation, or a link from somebody else's website to your website, which is a backlink at that point. We have link building, and backlinking, which are basically the same things. It's just a way to garner these backlinks. And typically this is done through content marketing or content strategy. And that's just a way to build content that drives traffic and backlinks to your site. Absolutely. So Gabe, you said that link building and backlinking are pretty much the same thing, but I know that Google made link building a bad word several years ago. Is that why backlinking is now a thing? Yeah, I mean, it, they're basically just synonyms, but link building is sometimes like uh, that's the, you know, black hat slash gray hat way of garnering backlinks. It's like the weird way of, you know, making another faux site and linking back to yourself. That's kind of what link building is. Sometimes you'll, you know, have people outreach to you with spam content like, hey, do you want to build some links? Uh, you know, pay me this amount of money and I'll point this amount of backlinks to your website. So they're really synonyms, but depending on what source you consume, uh, they can be two different things. Yeah, and if you believe in playing dirty pool, there's a lot of black hat tactics to drive a lot of traffic to your website through link building schemes. We do not practice, nor do we preach 
black hat linking tactics at BFO. Uh, everybody, everybody here, we practice white hat, but we know a little bit about the black hat stuff just so we know where the boundaries are in terms of what Google's gonna be looking at or not looking at, but we're not focusing on that today. In fact, today we're focusing squarely on sort of internal links. So we're gonna talk about internal links. There's really, I mean, you can have internal links all over your website. Some are worth more than others. And what we've got here is we've got sort of the three most common, right? You've got your header links, which are navigational. You've got footer links, and then you've got contextual stuff. And Gabe, can you take us a little further into sort of the contextual links and what those links on a, on a page mean and what Google's thinking in terms of number of links on a page? Yeah, so we have three you know, types of links listed here, but really there's just two. It's just navigational and contextual links, right? So navigational is anything that lives in your header or footer. And that's kind of a quality over, or a quantity over quality type of play because it's on every single page of your website, right? Meanwhile, contextual links are, they, they live in the body and they provide a little bit more context to Google. So that's why they're, they're good. They provide more context in the form of what you'll see highlighted is the anchor text. So that needs to be kind of keyword rich. It needs to be keyword rich to the page that you're pointing it to. And that's very important. Um, and it needs to basically just live within the body copy of that page. All right, we'll dive in a little more, a little further later on as we talk about specific instances and what we're looking for in internal linking plans. All right, why should we link internally? What's the value of our managing the internal links on our websites and moving link juice around is what a common phrase is. So what are we doing and why becomes the question. And we sort of have the big three over on the left side, but really this is about making sure that users and bots find the most appropriate content to answer their question. So if your site, generally speaking, is architected well, you've spent a ton of time on your navigation, you've spent a ton of time on your homepage. If you spend an equal amount of time on your internal linking methodology, you're going to win by an even greater margin, simply because you're thinking about it. If you think about pillar pages or hub pages on your website, where should you direct that traffic? Where do you want the bots to land? Where do you want the users to land? And how do you want them to perceive that? That all comes down to link placement. It comes down to anchor text and so forth. So Gabe, take us in a little further about the user experience and bots that we see here. Yep. So the more links that you have within a given post, right? The more uh, people are going to click on those and drive further and further down the funnel number one, which is going to increase the time on site. It's going to increase their engagement rate overall. And um, we would have used bounce rate, but bounce rate is going away in GA4, so we are not, no longer using that. Instead, we are using engagement rate. And therefore, you know, driving user, users further down the funnel makes more money overall. Yeah. And users behave in a very similar way as bots do. And that's on purpose, right? because Google is smart, they figured this stuff out. They click on links, that's the only thing that they do. They click on links and they garner context, right? So as users are driven down the funnel, so are bots and they figure out those sort of relationships in the same way that users do. And so it's just as valuable for the bots as it is for users. And in essence, it builds authority. Right, because the more links that we have pointing to a certain page, the more authority it garners, um, both with that engagement rate stuff that we were just talking about, and um, bots are going to land on them a lot more. So they they see these amount of links that you have pointing to that page, and they're like, "Wow, that must be a really important page that you have here." Cool. I'm going to tap into something that Gabe mentioned about GA4. So on a for those of you who've been keeping score, there was a major announcement about GA4 last week in Universal Analytics. Um, if you hit our website, we just published a blog post about GA4 and some of those timelines. And look ahead, a couple of months, we'll be having a GA4 webinar. I think and I might miss this. Kyle will let me know when I'm wrong. I think we're going to do it in May because we're talking about GA4 and Universal Analytics. There's going to be a data collections and we're trying to help people migrate into GA4 sooner rather than later so that you can preserve year over year data. So take a look at that stuff for yourself. Doesn't mean we need to help you, but there's a great article on our blog that might help guide your path on that if you're, if you're thinking about it. I'll get back to link building now or internal linking, sorry. All right, in the land of what makes a good link, we've all got links on websites. We all click on links all day long. 
but there really is an anatomy of a link. There are several factors that go into the link. Some are more important than others, but really the key is it's relevance, it's anchor text. There's several other things that go into it here, but the idea is we wanna make sure our links are as good as they can be. So let's think about that. And, and Gabe, tell us what you believe makes a good link. I don't, I don't care if you go one through six or six to one or just cherry pick a couple of these, but uh, tell us how you feel. Yeah, for sure. So basically a good end file link is something that provides context overall, both to users and to Google. And the way that you do that is typically through keyword rich anchor text. And like we were mentioning before, that keyword rich part needs to be to the page that it's relevant to rather than the best or rather than the originating page, right? So those keywords, when you do keyword research, that link needs to be pointing to that destination page. And those are what the keywords need to be focused on. And then it needs to be follow rather than no follow, which is basically just a meta tag that you can add onto a link. And we'll get to that kind of, you know, what the difference is between follow and no follow in the future. But basically just know that it needs to be a follow link rather than a no follow. And last thing that I'll add here is the higher up that link is on the page, the more value it provides. So that's kind of why navigational links should be the most important pages or, you know, the most important pages and therefore the most important links because they're literally at the top of the page. Wonderful. All right. I think that's about enough background. What do you say we get into talking about a plan and building out your plan? So I hope everybody sort of gets the background, why internal links are important, backlinking in general and, and why links are there and what makes a good link. Let's talk about building a plan for yourself so that you can get after some of this stuff and start extracting some of the value that's been lurking, if you will, on your website. All right, again, a quick outline. We're gonna talk about these seven items. We'll, we'll jump in. We'll give you some ideas, some feedback, some takeaways in terms of how to go about this stuff on your own. All right, first things first, pre-work. Kyle edited this because I said this shit is important. He wrote, you don't wanna skip it, which is fine. They both work. Um, this is why we have editors. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it works out. So you, what you want to do is you want to make sure you've got this stuff covered. And I think Gabe has here authority pages, but you want to identify what your hub pages are and or should be. You want to think about topic clusters. This is your keyword research and it's mapping your keywords back together in phrases. Authority pages are those, author, those pages where you want to drive this authority. And then separately, but also very important, you've got old content that you can leverage and re-leverage to support your growth goals. I think one of the most important things here is to think about authority pages and bringing everything back into that. So I'm gonna ask Gabe to dive into the image he has here and talk about some of this stuff. Yeah, so there's two things. The first thing is the pages that you want to drive authority to, right? So those should be the pages that you point a bunch of internal links to. The other thing is authority pages that are already gauged authority pages from Google, which is what we have listed in the picture here. These are pages that already have backlinks pointing to them. Therefore, the links originating from them are very high quality, right? So let's take the homepage, the most backlinked page in existence on the website, right? Any page or any link from that page is going to be gauged as the most important from Google because it has the most backlinks already pointing to it. So you need to dive in and do a little bit of research on how many backlinks are pointing to what page. And on top of that, where you want to drive the authority to on top of that with the topic cluster and stuff. And even go so far as to draw it out, right? Draw out your topic clusters. That's a great way to visualize it. Awesome. Gabe, I'm going to ask you a question here about the image I'm, I'm looking at. I'm looking at number five. And okay. number five is... The, obviously a 301 redirect. It has some authority and it has some backlinks to it. Um, explain that to me and explain to our audience what they should be looking at that for and what, what maybe they should do with it. The 301 redirect? So I can tell you that specifically, it took me a little bit to figure this out too. What you see right next to it on the left of that www dot is the padlock, right? So that means that we are redirecting um, our HTTP version of the site over to the HTTPS secured version of the site. And that's fine. That just means that we have 165 links 
backlinks really pointing to the HTTP version rather than the HTTPS version. And when it comes to backlinks, it's too much of a hassle to reach out and say, hey, do you mind changing this link to HTTP versus HTTPS? So I would gauge this as best practice, right? Just redirecting it over to the secure version of the site, which Google likes better anyway, and just leaving them be. But that sets us up because we do have control over those internal links. We don't have control over our backlinks necessarily, but we do have control over our internal links. So make sure that none of those redirect and none of those are broken, which we'll get to a little bit later. Thank you, good sir. All right, again, this is a repeat slide about link placement, but this is the spot where we get to dive in just a little bit deeper about links on pages. So basically a question that we get a lot is, I already have my services pages up in the main nav. Should I or can I include it again in the context? And the answer is absolutely. And you probably should be on your resources pages. And the reason is basically just context, right? It's context for Google, it's context for users, and it's driving them throughout the funnel. So not only does it funnel page authority and link equity, link juice, whatever you want to call it, but it also funnels those users which in a roundabout way impacts your SEO just as much. So Gabe, I've read some stuff about number of links on a page, number of links in a paragraph. What are your general rules of thumb for, for trying to stay within some, some relative constraints? And I, I know that Google doesn't, it, it's not that they won't crawl them. I've, I've read that they ignore them over a certain number because they, mm -hmm. they believe they lack value at a certain point. Yeah, I think the best SEO answer I can give and this is the one people hate us for is, it depends, right? <laughs> it was coming, I knew it was coming. It, it always depends. But it, it depends on how much, how many words that you have on each page. The more words that you have per page, the more links that you can have out from that page. And we have a really good example from HubSpot, I think a little bit later in the presentation that kind of shows us in a visual format, but really, you're not going to be overdoing it 99% of the time. Add those links. Add, I wouldn't say as much as you want. Don't hyperlink every single word. But even if you do like <laughs> three to four per paragraph, that's completely fine. Yeah, be mindful of your audience and, and be mindful of having relevant anchor text is what I would add to that. All right, cool. Speaking of anchor text, Okay, then tell us about why we should why we should choose the amazing anchor text on the left versus the crappy anchor text on the right. Yeah, I mean, it all relates to context, right? Just providing those keywords, providing that context to users and to Google so that it can funnel traffic accordingly and funnel the bots accordingly. So we like the ones on the left because they have those keywords, they have SEO, which, you know, we do. And um, it has, you know, relevant anchor text to the next page. Meanwhile, uh, the ones on the right, it's just standard CTAs. They're great CTAs, right? Include them in a meta description, include them at the bottom of an ad or whatever, but don't make them your anchor text unless you have nothing else, right? That's my one caveat to that. If you have nothing else, no keywords that should be focused on a page, which is not the case most of the time, um, then yeah, you can use it. You answered my question already about when when should you use those ones on the right? Um, yeah, when you have nothing left, yeah. when you have nothing left is is there is the right answer? All right, folks in the audience, how are we doing thus far? Are we uh, are we helping? I sure hope we are. Um, hope you're enjoying the webinar thus far. We'll we'll keep going. I just want to stop and take a quick breather, catch your breath. We'll go ahead and click on through and keep rolling. Again, questions, drop them in the in the Q and A. We'll get to them at the end. We'll make sure we answer all of them. For those that we can't answer live, we will gladly follow up with an email. All right, multiple links. So again, I think we talked a bit about this, getting into it. I think the, the most important things we added to this page, in addition to multiple links, which we'll talk about a little bit, are duplicate links on a page and also no follow tags, which I think we talked about a little bit, but let's take it a little bit deeper. Yeah, so we have here relevant links are always good. You'll see this screenshot from HubSpot where they have, I think I counted at one point, I think it's like they have 
16 or something internal links on this one screenshot alone, which is just a part of their <laughs> entire blog on this. So like we talked about before, you're probably not going to overdo it in terms of internal links. Now, duplicate links, right? We talked a little bit about that from the header or you know the navigation versus the body. And if you can duplicate links, the answer is yes, you can. It's not going to pass any more page authority. That does that with the first link, but it is going to provide more context and it is going to funnel users, which again, in a roundabout way, will impact SEO for the better. No follow tags. No follow tags are typically what you see on like social media sites. So Facebook or something, if you post a link on Facebook, they can't vouch for that link. They're like, eh, you know, I don't know. It could be okay, it could not be okay, but we're gonna no follow it just in case. So why would you do that on your own website? You're saying that you don't trust yourself if you, you know, put a no follow tag on one of your internal links. So just make the take the time to make sure that every single one of your internal links is follow rather than no follow because it's it sends conflicting signals otherwise. And Gabe, just a quick heads up, we're getting a little static on your on your microphone. I don't know if there's anything you can adjust. Um, oh, <clears throat> oh, that sounds amazing. Cool. And <laughs> then um, last thing is outbound links. Those are totally fine too, because those are treated as citations, and that's kind of how we should use them too as citations. Um, and that just signals to Google that we know what we're talking about and we did our due diligence in terms of research. When should we use no follow tags on links, Gabe? Um, we should use them for external links that we cannot necessarily verify um, the authenticity of. So there's a lot of cases that, that can happen. It kind of, it's a case by case basis really, but if you can't necessarily uh, verify, like I said, the authenticity of the link or the author or whatever, if you can't vouch for them, then it's probably a good idea to add a no follow on there. Otherwise, keep them follow. Um, there's an old rule in, in linking and it's a bow tie, right? So think about your website sitting in the middle and on the left side are all the links coming into your website and on the right side are all the links you're giving away. And they say, don't be shy about giving away links to third parties. Now, don't give away all of your link juice, but it's good practice to link out to other sites because people are linking to us. We also want to link to them. And to Gabe's point, there are situations there where you might consider a no follow tag, if depending on who you're linking to and why. So double check some no follow rules, but also make up no follow rules for yourself. Um, don't just follow what people are saying. Go out and do some research. You can check our site. You can check places like Search Engine Journal and a few others to find out what you should and shouldn't be no following. Awesome. And then just to jump in here real quick, we actually have our first question that came through. So this pertains to the anchor text slide. And somebody is asking, what about ADA? I heard I had heard that link saying click here is better for ADA. Okay, so that's yeah, ADA compliance is becoming a big thing in SEO. That's like screen readers and stuff for context. So um, we want to make sure that all of our images have alt text on them so that those screen readers can actually, you know, see what's on there and read it accordingly. Um, best practice, if you absolutely need to for ADA compliance, is make it keyword rich and then add that click here or read more at the end of it. So it kind of accomplishes those both of those things at once. But even if you have like the click here or read more at the end and the keyword rich anchor text right here, that's probably best case scenario because then you get the ADA compliance. And on top of that, you get the keyword rich anchor text that we're talking about. Cool. Awesome. Thank Hope you. That answers your question. If you have any follow up, please, uh, please feel free to drop it in Q&A. All right, moving on, broken and redirected links. I'm just gonna shut up and let you handle this slide, Gabe, because I know you dig into these all day, every day, and you love it. Yeah, so broken links are something that we come across quite often. Um, typically to find these and the redirected links, we have to do a site crawl first to determine where they live, what page they're on, what anchor text they have, and kind of identify them manually. And then we just wanna update them really, because like we, like we alluded to before, we can't necessarily control the anchor text of our backlinks 
or where our backlinks are pointing, but we can control our internal links. So we want to optimize those as best as we can, really. Um, so we want to replace our broken internal links with something with a link that functions, right? <laughs> if it 404s, change it to a link that uh, has a 200. And then um, same thing with redirected links. Those are a little bit harder to find. Um, but if it 301s or if it 302s, um, we're losing a little bit of link equity every time that redirects over. And in terms of user experience, it's not great, right? Somebody clicks on a link and then it redirects over to another page. We can control that. So remove that redirected part and just put in the standard 200 link and you should be good. Finding it is kind of the, the trouble there. It's just with a site crawl. Awesome. Awesome. I don't have any questions. I'll save a question or two on this for later when we get into Q&A. All right. <clears throat> All right. Managing link depth. There's, there's a lot to be said about how far away from the top of a site the content is. And this is where I always like to use that old Tootsie Roll, uh, Tootsie Pop Owl picture. How many clicks does it take uh, to get to the content you really want on a website? And there's a general rule, but the rules can be broken depending on the size and shape of the site. So what we have here is, is four levels, but it really depends on how much content you have or how many pages you have. E-commerce could be a little deeper. Um, a general information site might be a little shallower. The key is to make sure your linking is built right. And I'll let Gabe fill in a little more detail here as well. Yeah. So it starts getting kind of complicated with e-com, right? Because you have your categories, your subcategories, sometimes your sub subcategories, all of these things. And you kind of have to manage those in terms of linking. So really what we're talking about here, at least at the top couple of layers is navigation, right? Main header or footer navigation. Typically on an e-com site, we'd want to make the recommendation typically to add like a faceted navigation. And what I mean by that is include both your categories and your subcategories in there. And what that does is it makes it to where it kind of just cuts out a tier, right? So instead of being the subcategories being where you have to click on a category first to get to that subcategory, well, now it's included in the navigation, which is better for both bots and users. And it kind of pushes it up a tier. So it makes it more important. And um, it makes the product pages more important by effect, because now instead of having to click four times to go to one of these, they only have to click three times to go to one of the product detail pages. Now, on something not as complicated as an e-com site, it, it's a little bit easier. Just include your services pages you know, as a drop down. Include your about pages, include your resource pages and the type of resources that you have. And that kind of functions in the same way as a faceted nav would for uh, an e-com site, really. Yeah, and the cool thing is to think about, yes, you need to figure out your navigation and your flow, but at some point your homepage is gonna drop down to the third and fourth level to, to what Gabe was speaking about. And really, where do you want the traffic to land? When traffic is coming from Google, where do you want it to land? Do you want it to land on your homepage? Preferably, it's probably on your second level category and even your detail pages, depending on the search. So when I think about this, and I'm going to get into some SEO and not necessarily link building here or, or backlinking or internal linking or whatever we're calling it today. The, the idea is that make sure you've got content driving on those pages as well. That's supporting your anchor text for your links. And if you're going to, if you're going to end around from your homepage to your top level category into your detail pages, make sure there that it's contextually appropriate to drive down there because you want, if you're collecting authority at a lower level, you want to make sure every link coming down there is, is aimed in the right direction with the right anchor text and with the right context. So there are ways to sort of influence pages at that lowest level, because really that's where we're going to want people to land. So think about that. Now I'm not saying shortcut your whole site and a quick horror story that I was a part of early days is we had a client who insisted on cross-referencing every category on their website with every other category on their website, which created an infinite number of, I don't think it was infinite, but a very, very large number of crawlable pages because they could keep building categories together. And they had 50 or 60 category tags and they just kept going over and over and over. Well, Google got dizzy doing that. 
in finding all of these pages. Ultimately, the way out of it was to eliminate a lot of it with a robots.txt and with some, some tags on pages, but be mindful of your internal linking strategy in that regard. Users might have to find some content for you to keep your website as friendly as you can to the search engine. So last thing you wanna do is make Google busy. Also to that point, put content on your category pages, right? So that they even have keywords to begin with. Describe what the category is, give a little bit more context there. It's all about context, really. Just providing context to users and to Google. And the more links that you start to point to those category pages, the more Google and users are going to think that they're more important. That becomes an authority page. Mm -hmm. All righty. I was just told, don't forget the orphan page. Where's Annie? Where is Annie? Where do... <laughs> hold, hold on a second. We're going to find orphan Annie. Here she is. I don't, I, um, so a, a word about orphan and we threw four or four pages on here as well. Your site will orphan pages from time to time. We had a client who through their CMS and no fault of their own, when they wanted to remove a page because they launched something bigger, better, faster, more, they would simply go in and they would say, okay, this page is dead. Here's the thing. It didn't remove the page. The CMS didn't redirect the page. So you had this page out there in the middle of nowhere. And guess what? Some of these pages got a, a pretty significant amount of traffic, but they were out on this island. So Ultimately, Google is just going to stop thinking about those pages because there are no more links pointing to them. Now, you do have external links coming in there, but you have no internal links. So you've now, the rest of the world thinks this page is important, but your site says, ignore it, ignore it, ignore it. What's Google going to do with that page? Well, yeah, ultimately, they're just going to remove it. They're going to drop it. So yeah. you're giving up all that traffic. So I'm not saying your CMS does this, but it can happen. I know Gabe is going to tell us that orphan pages are the hardest pages often to find them. Yeah, it's true, especially like after a site transition and you lose the pages that you previously had or you lose track of what the URL structure was, it's it's really difficult to find those unless they're already, like Steve mentioned, in the Google index. So if there's no internal links pointing to them, and let's say worst case scenario, there's no external links pointing to them, they don't exist to Google because the only thing, like we mentioned, that bots crawl are links, right? So how is Google going to crawl or find these pages if there's absolutely zero links pointing to them? So that's also why they're super difficult to find, right? Because our crawlers work in the exact same way as Googlebot does and crawls links, but they have no links pointing to them. So we have to look in Google index to see if they exist. We'd look in the CMS like WordPress, for instance, to see if they exist. Um, we'd look uh, in the sitemap to see if they exist. But outside of that, there's really no way to pinpoint them. Yeah, interesting indeed. Um, this is one of those things that probably shouldn't make the top of your list unless you know that perhaps you are doing something where you're just sort of disconnecting a page and it's out there and it has some equity. The interesting thing that we wanna point out is, I don't know if you've noticed, uh, but we've been clicking on the logo in the bottom right of the screen throughout the deck, which is why we ended up not finding our orphan page because the logo is skipping slides and moving through. So it's this idea, our own slide linking strategy was a little bit sideways because we never got to our orphan slide, which we wanted to, but we wanted to do that to show that, by the way, it's not linked to anything, so we're not going to get there, which is why when Kyle pointed it out on the backside here, I said, oh, I need to go find the orphan slide. And typically these happen with site transitions, right? Like. If you, if you do a site transition, you change your entire URL structure and you don't redirect all of those old pages, well, now it has no old pages that are pointing to that anymore. So unless you're doing proper redirect strategy through the site transitions, you might come into contact with some orphan pages or not because you might not find them. My advice, if you find an orphan page, adopt it. They need links. We actually have a related question here, and uh, someone is asking, when would we want, would you ever want to intentionally have an orphan page? And if you did, what would that use case be? That's a good point. So a lot of times orphan pages are like paid media landing pages, in which case 
we might want to go so far as like to no index them entirely so that they can't be seen, you know, outside or can't even be searched for. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit outside of the SEO scope. That's more into the SEM strategy. If you want a page ranked on Google organic, you want to have links pointing to it. I'm going to jump in here and say your landing page strategy, if for paid media, should be that every one of those pages be kept out of Google's index. You don't want them crawled because, and, and, and it's a small thing, but from an SEO perspective, they could steal some of your juice. If you've got a page that's related to it somewhere on your website, it might give a little bit of juice to this landing page because we've had situations where a client's landing pages, oddly enough, were linked to by a whole host of third-party sites. And Google wanted to index them and they wanted to rank them, which, you know, in some ways it's sort of free traffic, but there's no value because you, don't, you haven't seen an ad and, and you're not clicking on a keyword. So they're searching for a term and they're landing on a landing page. They're scratching their heads and going away. It's not targeted traffic really. So yeah, we want to make sure that the paid landing pages aren't even included in the index. And like Steve mentioned, sometimes we have it to where those cannibalize keywords that we would other, otherwise be ranking for on another page when we have all the content on this other page that is so much better for it. So yes. we want to keep those out of the index and therefore they're kind of orphan pages, but on purpose. <laughs> Intentionally orphaned. We left it. I'm not, I'm not even going to make a joke there. Any joke is going to be bad. All right. There's a couple of resources for you here. If you want to check some stuff out, um, Gabe and I are also happy to be resources. Send us an email, webinar at BeFound Online. Kyle will throw them in our general direction. We'll be happy to help. If you want to jump on a call, bug us that way too. Happy to help out as best we can. We don't just do this for the money. We do this to be able to give back to the community, which is all of you listening and even anybody else, which is why this content will be made public because this is the idea. The idea is that we're going to, we're going to learn, we're going to teach, we're all going to grow together. And that's really the key for us is being able to get back in this way. I think with that, Kyle's going to join us again with some closing housekeeping and some Q&A, right, Kyle? That is correct, Steve. We do have a couple more questions here uh, that I think we should get through before we wrap up today. So a few of the questions that came through are, how should I prioritize broken links after I have a list? Yeah, I think that's, that's an important thing to point out. So the way that we should prioritize those are off of any authority pages or to any pages that we want to drive authority to, right? So the first one would be any links pointing out from our most heavily backlinked pages. So prioritize the home page there. And then the next thing is, let's say we want a service to rank. Any links pointing to those that are broken, we should prioritize, prioritize those as well. Great. Uh, next up, we have, so for blog platforms that are integrated into websites, do they still have the same value or link juice as, say, the domain itself? So can you repeat the question? Yeah. So for blog platforms, like third-party blog platforms that get integrated into a larger website, mm -hmm. do those still carry the same value or link juice of, say, the host domain? Okay, so we're talking like subdomains here. If it's on a subdomain, typically, and this is getting really into the weeds, typically subdomains are treated as completely separate domains. So it does still carry some value, yes. And since you have like the same header and the same footer and the same context across that blog, really you need to make your blog section, even if it is on a subdomain, as similar to your website as possible to provide that context to say, hey, this is a web, or, you know, a subdomain that we want indexed and we want to provide value to um, the links to and from it, right? Yeah. So yes, in a roundabout way, it does provide value, not as much value unless that's your most heavily linked or backlinked subdomain, if that makes sense. But typically, it's going to be your main primary domain that's the most backlink to. So those will carry the most value or the links pointing out from those will carry the most value. Great. That's awesome context. Thank you. There's also one more sort of nerdy answer for this is that you can do some aliasing. If you have a, 
a, a blog that's hosted on a different site and you want to incorporate it, you could alias URLs into your site. There's some work to be done there, but you can do it and it'll look like it's your site as long as that blog site won't be indexed as well. Uh, otherwise, you'd have your content living in two places and you don't want that. Yeah, you can either do it with um, JavaScript or you can do it with CDN, like Cloudflare workers. But like Steve said, that is a nerdy side point. Well, we like the nerdy stuff over here. So we've got a couple more questions here. Uh, the next one being, how do I know if I am using good anchor text? Yeah, I think uh, the main thing there is to do um, keyword research to start with, right? So you should already have keyword research, what you want to rank for, kind of your three tiers of keywords, like your very lofty goals uh, right here, then you have probably can rank for and then already rank for. So, you know, just take a little bit of time of looking at those and, um, you know, write the anchor text accordingly. And you, you won't know how great your anchor text is. I mean, you'll see some, you'll probably see some click through some Google and maybe you'll see some lift in the search rankings, but there in, in some ways, if you're, if you're meeting your goals in terms of driving traffic or driving leads or conversions on your website, then there's almost an assumption that your anchor text is working for you. That's a good point too. Yeah. Just watch your keyword rankings and monitor, the, monitor those over time. Great. All right. Last question here. Is there a rule for how long I should leave 301s or 302s live? So if it's an internally linked 301 or 302, the answer is never. <laughs> you should look at those immediately and change those over as soon as possible. In terms of like, let's say a site transition happens and there's a 301 strategy, you know, to transfer all the link equity over, Typically we say indefinitely, but Google usually picks up on these and redirects everything over within about a year. So leave them up for at least 12 months. And if you absolutely need to remove them, you can at that point. I would still recommend against it though. As far as 302s go, that's a little bit different. The only reason that you should really have a 302 up is if you have a product out of stock um, in which case, remove it once it's back in stock. <laughs> um, and leaving 301s up doesn't cost you anything. Sure, it might be a couple of cycles on your web server. But if I think about the graphic we had before about authority pages and are just redirecting from HTTP to HTTPS, think about all those backlinks coming in to a page. Let's think if you have a page that has 200 links coming into it and you redirect that page via 301. Now, Google's gonna pick up on the new page, but you're never gonna to talk to those 200 webmasters and you're never gonna get 200 links updated. So it doesn't hurt you one bit to leave those 301s in place. Now, here's the thing. If you work on your site time and time and time again, you're gonna end up with a whole bunch of 301s and you can find yourself in 301 loops. So I will caution against that. Uh, you could find yourself in, in dual 301s and Google hates those as much as they hate four or four pages. Yeah, I've seen, um, actually the other day I clicked on an organic SERP result on Google that um, when I clicked on the link, it was caught in a redirect loop where it just kept appending .html over and over and over again. And it never ended. It never <laughs> brought me to the homepage. It was just .html, .html, .html. And you can get into that kind of cycle if you don't constantly take a look at your redirects, at least, you know, revisit them once every six months, once every year, whatever, just to see if you have any of those loops or those chains. All right, Kyle, anything else? Yeah, you know, we actually did have one more question come through. So somebody is asking if, if anyone on this call has uh, thoughts on internal redirects for tracking traffic from a campaign. Um. I would do it with UTM parameters instead of internal redirects personally, if you can, um, just because UTM parameters don't redirect and they also give you those tracking parameters that you can see within Google Analytics at the same time. If you need an interstitial page for some other reason though, 
Um, actually, Kyle, can you read the question one more time? Sure. Uh, this person is asking thoughts on internal redirects for, tra for tracking traffic from a campaign. Gotcha. So if you do need an interstitial page uh, for tracking purposes, first of all, I agree with Gabe 100%. But if for whatever reason you have to bring it in and it's got a loop and go somewhere else, then leave the leave the 301 in place. You're going to you can count the page that it comes to, but you might end up doing a header redirect there, but you do not want that page indexed. So what you want is you want them to land on it. So you count the page view coming from your campaign, but then you're going to do a header redirect, which isn't just the straight up 301, but you can still do it there and then kick it off to the next page. So you can do that, but I will caution you to make sure that Google is not going to index that page because they hate that stuff. That's People really do great it. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> great. That is, a, that is the extent of the questions that we've got here, unless anyone has one that they want to sneak in at the last second. It looks like no. So with that, Gabe, Steve, did you guys have any closing remarks or any takeaways that you want everyone to keep in mind before, before we wrap today? I've got closing remarks. I'm sure Gabe has some key takeaways. Great. I mean, the main thing is just identify your authority pages that are already authorities, link out from those first, make sure the anchor text is keyword rich, and then uh, you know, identify the pages that need some love and point to those. That's the main thing. You're, you're basically just trying to provide more context to users and to Google. And by providing a better user experience, you will increase your SEO because Google, the, it's treated the same thing as a user. Googlebot tries to model their behavior off of users and you know, a good user experience is good SEO. I'll amen that. And I just want to add, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And join us next month, where we'll be talking about external links and or backlinking. I don't think we'll get into content marketing much, but they're kind of hand in hand. So join Gabe and us. Gabe, it's you and I again next month, right? I'm not sure. We'll have to talk offline about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Possibly. Well, join me next month and maybe Gabe as we talk about external linking and backlinks and what you can do there, how you can grow them and what they mean for your site. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much. Before we conclude today, I just wanted to let everyone know if you've been panic taking notes this entire time, the slides will be available um, as will be the replay for this webinar. If you've registered for this webinar, you will get an email that succinctly wraps up the replay video, um, any other materials and the internal linking blog that Steve mentioned earlier. So thank you all so much for your time today. Please follow us on social media and be on the lookout for some follow-up materials, including the replay. Thank you all so much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Take care.